Great to see a full auditorium. Uh, I'm very pleased to see, I'm personally pleased to see so many guys here. Um, let me say something to the guys for one minute, if I may. Um, it's really important that us guys have around 50% of the leadership positions in Minnesota, okay? So we gotta stand up for ourselves, but we have to recognize that we're not gonna get 100% of them. Uh, and it's really important that we have to recognize how we need to work with colleagues of the other gender. And I, that's why I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this talk and I'm glad so many men are here. Dr. Carol Fault is somebody who, who really does not need a long introduction. The, the key things you need to know about Dr. Fault is that she is a very distinguished scientist, biologist. Um, those of you who are interested in the sciences and potentially pursuing a career in the sciences, I'd recommend you try and find a way to get to her talk, her public forum lecture tomorrow at 10 a.m. in here, when she will be talking about the future science and technology education. But she's also, of course, uh, well known for us, <coughs> distinguished as an academic administrator, as the provost of Dartmouth College. Uh, the provost is the, the dean, the chief academic officer of Dartmouth College, and as most of you know, Dartmouth is one of America's great universities, uh, one of the eight universities of the famous Ivy League, one of only nine, I think, universities that were founded before America was founded. One of the nine that were founded uh, in British colonial times. Uh, as the provost, uh, Dr. Fault has reporting to her the deans of some of America's great graduate schools. The Dartmouth Medical School, for example, one of the leading medical schools in the world. The, Tuck School of Business, one of the top MBA schools in the world. The Thayer College of Engineering, one of the America's great engineering schools. And I very much hope that partly due to our growing partnership with our friends at Dartmouth College, that some of you will get a chance to study at Dartmouth, either to go there for graduate school or to take a semester or a year as an undergraduate, or perhaps to go for a short course or a summer program. I can tell you from my own visits there that Dartmouth is a wonderful institution, and we're really proud that they've agreed to work with us. Having said all that, I know that you are not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to Dr. Fault, and I am really eager to hear her talk about a subject she has studied and cares a lot about, which is the role of women as leaders. Dr. Fault. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, too, because I'm, I feel like we have a long-term relationship already with the American University of Kosovo, and it's a very important relationship for Dartmouth. Uh, it might be hard for you to realize this uh, because I'm speaking to students at so young a university, but Dartmouth is getting ready to celebrate its 250th. Now, we think of using that moment, that mark, 2019, to say we, it's great what we've done in the past, but what's important to us, it's about what we're going to do in the future. So we sit as partners with a building university in a building country with just as much of a need to look forward as any other place. Those 250 years that we have behind us are great, but they don't really tell us what to do in the future. We have a brand new president. His name is Jim Young Kim. And he spent his life working on things like AIDS in Africa and tuberculosis in Haiti. And he said when he became president of our university that it's wonderful to look at what we do here. This is fantastic, but we need to do something else. We need to st start going out to the rest of the world. And going out to the rest of the world, not to talk about what we do, but to find out what they're doing. And to learn from people around the globe about the issues that are facing us, 
the issues that all of you are going to be working on 20, 40 years from now, what is going to be important? What can we do now to make sure that we're creating an education for future students that will put them in a position to lead the world to a better future? And how can we work together in new ways across oceans that might have separated us across politics that might have kept us apart in the past? Let's get rid of that old thinking and let's start thinking about new partnerships and new ways of doing business. So in all those ways, I see it as a great opportunity to come talk to you, learn from you, and work with you in any way that we can uh, to build bridges uh, as peoples and as universities. It's also interesting because 2019 is, is close to 10 years away. Now, for some of you, 10 years might seem like a long time. Uh, it doesn't seem like such a long time to me. It seems like it's actually a pretty short time to start thinking about now what we really want to be in 10 years or for you to think about what your university and your country is going to be in 10 years is a very important timeline. It means that almost everything that we do every day, every new program we start, every new student that comes to school here and graduates is going to have a very important and a big role at the development of your university, your country, and your world partnerships in a way, maybe a better opportunity than at any other time. At the beginning, you have a chance to do such incredible things. So we look, even in our university, at that 10 years and say, this is very important. Let's make the right decisions, and let's see what we could actually accomplish in what seems to be a fairly short period of time. I know that just last October, right here in Pristina, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was speaking. How many of you had a chance to hear her? Did any of you get to go? She's quite an amazing, that is a dynamo. She's like your president, who is another incredibly dynamic uh, woman uh, leader in the world. And I know that she was also stressing the importance of both uh, opportunity, but also perseverance and patience. And she said, as frustrating as this may be, 10 years in a lifetime is a long time. But 10 years in the life of a country, or I would say in the life of a university, is actually a short time. Progress doesn't happen overnight. So we're all in that for that length of time. On the other hand, I always emphasize that every action you take now, though, does have a lot of influence. And its influence usually magnifies as it goes out in time. Now, I hope that all of you can see how much progress I see when I come here and see the progress being made in the country and at the university. And we often look at the United States, and maybe even, uh, especially when we're looking at things like leadership of women, but we've never had a woman president in the United States. And in fact, Dartmouth has never had a woman president. I'm the first uh, woman that was a dean of the faculty at Dartmouth. Uh, you know, so we're all still in the process of seeing the diversification of our leadership as we look across the country. And it's diversifying in gender <coughs> and ethnicity. These are things that take a while. In fact, it took my country a long time in many areas, including the advancement of women, to get where we are today. You probably know that America was almost 150 years old before half the population, well, not even half the population, before women had the right to vote. And it took us longer to bring our African-American voting rights to parity. So we had to take a long time to get to those points. We, at Dartmouth, we didn't actually begin admitting women until the 1970s. So it's hard for me to believe. I came there after women were admitted. But when I first came to Dartmouth and I started teaching in the biology department, uh, there were only about a third of the students were women. Now, of course, in the sciences, we are seeing still fewer women in areas like physics and chemistry, but in the life science. As uh, Chris was saying, it's 50-50. And in fact, in some areas, it's switching to the fact that women are now 60%. So we're starting to say the same thing about keeping men involved in these areas. You know, because we'd really like to see in all these areas of growth that it isn't about gender that keeps you in or puts you out, that it's about interest and ability. And these are things that the whole population is participating in. It wasn't also very long ago that women in the United States didn't have access to top institutions or positions of real leadership. And we had to make very specific plans 
to make opportunities available to our entire population. And I think some of the things we put in place may be of interest, and I think some of the things that you do will become of interest to us as we continue to develop our workforce. Now I'm going to talk a bit about science, and I have that perspective because I'm a life scientist. I was trained in that area. But the same things I say about representation and parity and opportunity in the science world are also true in the business world. We know that that is an area that uh, you're looking for ways to increase representation, bring people in, try to get people to feel like they could be successful. So I think these are lessons that really span all areas of professional development and expertise. Engineering, science, medicine, business, these are all very important. So I'm going to share a little story with you about what I think, what has really helped at Dartmouth at least as we started to move forward in, in trying to develop opportunities for all of our students to become not only successful in their undergraduate and professional careers, but to learn what it would take to actually become leaders in those fields when they went out into the workforce. So my own story, I came to Dartmouth in 1983 right out of graduate school. When I was in graduate school, I was in a very large research university in California, the University of California, and I was the only female with 15 male graduate students. So that was a pretty good area to learn how do you, <laughs> how do you get your way in there and what do you have to do. But going back a little bit to what your president said, I wouldn't have made it at all if I didn't have strong relationships amongst the men and the male mentors that were also very important for me learning how to develop my own career and move my uh, pathway forward. So it was in those partnerships that I learned a lot. Now I was very different from many women raised in my generation in that my mother, and I'll come back to her later, was the daughter of an immigrant family in America, was a scientist. Now for my mother to be a scientist was extremely unusual because there just weren't many women of the generation preceding me that were, were scientists. And my father was a scientist. So I was, in a way, a very fortunate person that when I grew up, nobody said to me, Carol, you can't be a scientist. In fact, they'd give me weather sets. I might have wanted a doll, and they'd give me a weather set for Christmas or a chemistry set. They were pretty determined. But that was a good thing, because I never was told once by anybody that anything I wanted to do was impossible. And that probably was the most important lesson I learned, was that if people tell you you can't do something, you have to not listen to it, and you have to be the voice that tells the other people around you that they can. Because so many, the longer I've been in the business, the more I learned that the doors open because people believe they'll open. And a lot of the doors are closed because we let them close. We believe that they can't be open, and so we don't go and play with that handle and pull it open. So I was lucky. I had parents that supported me in that. And so I went into the sciences not even knowing that I was going to be unusual. I just thought that's what people do. And even when I came to Dartmouth, you know, being, I was the only woman in the biology department. Uh, I started off there and I went into my laboratory and I closed the door and I thought, you know, I don't fit. I don't look like everybody here. How am I going to be successful? And I sat in that empty office and, and thought about things. And this is absolutely true. What changed my entire life, probably, was a knock that came on the door just about a week later. And it was a young, second year woman student. And the second my door was opened, and students, young students, started coming into that room with me, it changed everything that I, as a professor, thought. Because I thought, I know what I'm here for now. I, I can see what this is about. I'm going to build teams, and I'm going to build teams with these students, and we are going to do really exciting and fun stuff. And that was the total change for my own life. A few years later, we had a wonderful um, woman professor named Karen Wetterhahn, and she was a world's expert on chromium, which, by the way, is what I just learned today going over to the University of Pristina. Chromium in the environment is one of the big challenges facing this country. It's really a big challenge. And she was a pioneer. And she, she looked at our population of students and she said, look, we're getting some of the smartest students in the world that come here. And why are only about 10% of them women studying science? Let's build a new program. And we built a program called the Women in Science Program. 
And the whole point of that program was to take people as first year students or second. How many of you are first year students? So quite a few are second year students. It says, we're not going to wait till students already know what they want to do. We're going to take them in to our labs and we're going to start introducing them to that whole culture, how we do science. Science is a team building activity. It's not one person in a white lab coat sitting in a building playing with weird equipment. It's about working as a team, asking questions, being very interactive. We're going to bring them in at the start. And whether they become scientists or not isn't the real issue for us. It's making sure they're educated about what is one of the most pressing areas in the globe, scientific literacy and understanding. That program could be the type of program that you do for all students. And in fact, once the Women in Science program, we call it WISP, W-I-S, for Women in Science, there's a move to have MISP, Men in Science, <laughs> program too, because of course, it was important, the whole purpose of it was to develop, develop these mentorship relationships, bring people in, very young in their careers, teach them what it's like to actually be a scientist, not to just study from one, study from your business professor, learn what it would be like to actually create new knowledge and develop that. And those will be the programs that really make people leaders. Well, we've seen immense success uh, in those years since the WISP program began as a mentorship program. What I think was wonderful about the leaders of that program is that they also realized that education isn't just about facts in a book. And success and leadership is almost less about the facts in a book than it is about the relationships that you create. Now we take it for granted, and I would take it for granted here that you all know how to learn. I mean, you're here because you want to learn. Now, probably even secretly at different times, I don't know, do you have the word nerd here? You know what I mean when I say nerd? Uh, a lot of students at Dartmouth say, oh, secretly I'm a nerd, and I love getting to know all the other nerds. Well, they mean that very positively. They mean that we're people who love to read, we love facts, we like to ask questions. Maybe when we were growing up, people told us not to do that, that wasn't cool, you know, don't, don't show your, your smarts, but Basically, you're here because you love to learn. And we've learned as faculty, and I think as, as we develop further, that people can do a lot of that learning on their own. You can do that in a lecture. You can do that in books. You have that inquisitive nature. You can never say, I've learned enough. You're going to push yourself forward. But what we also want to do is teach you how to work with people. The future of almost all of our science technology, business, is being able to be a person who knows how to gather facts and accumulate knowledge, but knows how to work in teams to critically evaluate that knowledge. And that part of an educational process where you're learning together, you're challenging each other, you're not afraid to say no, but you're also part of saying, let's try a new future, let's build a new series of ideas, is really at the heart of the very best educational system that you can build. Now for us, the way we do it, and I think has been a really strong example here, is that we also think you should be trained in one than, more than one area. We don't want, for example, all of our engineers and we do want them to be very good at math. I don't want them to build a bridge that is not going to stand. But we would also like them to know a bit about ethics. We want them to know about politics. We want to have this liberal, we call it liberal arts learning, that says that the most creative minds will draw ideas from outside their discipline to make new ideas going forward. So the people that started this Women in Science program came from about six different departments. They weren't people that no, normally work together. And they said, this has to be, if we're going to build a new leadership in this area, they have to be interdisciplinary. So we have to have good learners. We have to have people that are willing to work in teams. We have to have people that are excited about interdisciplinary learning. The fourth piece, they said, 
is that we need to recognize that people have lives. So for women in America, this has been a very big issue. We still don't have gender parity. Right now, in the sciences, about 50% of the people going to graduate school, 50% of our doctors are women. But when you go and you look at the professors or the leaders in various industries, it drops down to about 20%. And that, there are probably lots of reasons, and I'd love to talk to you more about that, but some of it has to do with raising a family. Because women and men want to raise families at certain times of life, and those are often the exact same ages when you're also going out and you're building a career. So we've been trying to learn about ways that we can build structures that will support young populations. Your whole country is a young population. So it needs to have the support for the people who graduate with all these skills that can not only allow them to be successful, but do that in the context of the life that they want to build. So for the first time, we talk about it. You know, it wasn't, it's not embarrassing to say having children is important to me. Uh, if my predecessors had said that, the women couldn't say that. And in fact, men couldn't say it's important to me that my partner is able to work or have children or we need daycare or we need good policy. So these are all things that as a young country and a young university starts thinking about where it can really have leadership, it would be not only in bringing people in getting them a really high quality education, but would be teaching them about teams, about interdisciplinary, about trying to find a way to incorporate a hard working professional life with a, with a family or with a life that has other goals. These are all so incredibly important. And that Women in Science program was really the first uh, in our country that did it. And in fact, within two years of Dartmouth establishing WISP, 200 universities in America started a similar women in science program. So it was an innovation that clearly was needed and, and had a big power. So again, you have that wonderful position here that if you think almost every program you start that's successful has a chance, on my biological side, to replicate itself. You could be the DNA of higher education in that you can be fostering the evolution of the nation, but also you can be sending out uh, into the world programs that can really make a difference and have a very important role. Now, even in America, our work is not over. As I said, we're, we have uh, great inequities in our society. You know, the have and the have-nots are enormously different. Uh, there's different access to higher education. There would be many people in America that would say, I can't go to university, and I want to. We, we have dreams to have our entire country be open to university, and it's about 45% of the students in America now go to higher ed. Just 20 years ago, it was closer to 60%. So as costs have gone up and population has changed, we have some work to do there, too. Uh, one of the things that we also think we have work to do is to continue to open the doors to our education system to welcome people from other countries, but maybe more importantly even now is to open our doors to have Americans and people studying going out to work with and learn from other countries. That, like the Women in Science program, a student that comes over here, and we had a number of them who have come right here to, to work here in Pristina, have gone back so excited and energized about what they see happening here and also about their role as citizens of the world. You know, they don't see themselves now just as graduates of Dartmouth, residents of New Hampshire, citizens of the United States. They start seeing themselves as partners, as people who can work with and have friends in other countries. We want to do more of that and we'd love to find ways to get more opportunities for you too to take advantage of a chance to study overseas and try that. You know, this make this world as mobile as possible. Now, finally, just talking a little bit about women in these roles, because I think uh, women do have an extraordinary time. Uh, we're still minority in leadership roles, but clearly 
the world is waking up to the idea that half of its population needs to be part of solutions. We have, we have amazing needs. We want to make sure that women and men feel like they can have opportunities. What I've learned over the years is that to be a woman in a leadership role, a couple of things were really important. First of all, I didn't spend time thinking about being different. I, I didn't look back. And so I thought, if I'm the only woman in the room, that's okay. I'm friends with men and women. That's not, a, that's not a problem for me. I'm here to try to make relationships with everyone in the room. So I think it's important. Don't let yourself, you don't want to tell yourself you can't do it. You can. And I also learned I could do it as the person I was. Now this is a little bit uh, funny digression, but when I first went into the field of science too, women didn't even feel that they could do something like wear a skirt or high heels, or a mini skirt, Paris the Plan. And in fact, I find students and other people love the fact that leaders come in all shapes and sizes, and colors, and religions, and ethnicities. But you have to feel fine about that. That's OK. That's a good thing. And it's something that we can really support ourselves in difference. I think that's, that is, you won't know that because you're all young, but even 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been the message. They'd tell you, go look like everybody else, put on a uniform. The men are still stuck in that. Look at them wearing these ties and jackets. <laughs> Women get a lot better clothes to wear when they get to go out into the professional world. But, but it's a change, and it's a really good change because it, again, talks about this, we are who we are, and in fact, these are strengths we bring to our professional lives, so we don't have to suppress them. And then I think the final piece I want to mention, and then I, I do want to be able to answer questions, is that <laughs> we have to also not be afraid to fail. You know, it's not a mistake to try something that doesn't work. When you're in the middle of building a new program, even like Women in Science, a new university, and for heaven's sakes, a new country, not everything is going to work. But it's the bold people who won't be afraid of things not always being successful. And I think it's really important as university students, you know, not every grade's an A, not every experiment you write works. It's your process of learning through mistakes or things not working is actually the most important process a leader will bring, is someone that knows how to say it's okay to fail, but let's take that mistake and turn it into something that's really useful for us. So we try to do that as professors to, to teach students. We try to do it as parents. I'm the mother of two kids. I, I try to do that in that venue. We try to do it as uh, business leaders and as country builders. You know, try to have that partnership. So I think those are, are things that are very important, but it's not always easy to put it into practice when you're in the middle of learning and trying something new. We do this through education. You're participating in what could become the greatest industry of your country, which could be higher education. I, I absolutely believe that higher education is America's greatest strength. It's the most universal skill that we have to offer, and it's the one that's the most rapidly changing. It's great, and to be a small, powerful, flexible place with an education framework and a mentality about growth and learning, you have a chance to do things in even 10 years that larger, slower to move in countries can't do, and I, I dearly, truly believe that. I know um, that you have challenges, you, you are facing the very great challenges in your country. I know that you have, uh, want to get more students coming through secondary education. I know that you are aspiring to a membership in Europe where there's a different educational balance. You have that kind of growth to do. And I know you're fighting against or trying to bring in literacy across the country, but you've made immense changes in just 10 short years. So it looks like you have got the energy, I would certainly say, and the desire to do that. Women, of course, will play an extremely important role. And again, I can't emphasize how wonderful it was to see your president and have that chance to talk with her. I know she's going to be speaking at a global conference soon about leadership in women. Uh, I know that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is very excited about meeting her, bringing her over to Washington. So you have a lot to work forward to. So finally, just in closing and then for questions, I just want to say, in my role as provost, this amazing, wonderful position I have, I do get to think about how to improve scientific literacy and look for partnerships 
this is a partnership that I feel very grateful to be a part of and look to really intensifying it and maybe welcoming some of you to Hanover, maybe when it's not snowing, uh, but sometime soon in your history. And our partnership is to share. We're going to learn from you, and we hope that you're going to learn from us. It, it makes me uh, feel very grateful for it, and it makes me think um, about my family. So I just want to tell you, my mom, as I said, was from an immigrant family. Her grandparents grew up in Albania. And so I'm actually Albanian, but when I was growing up in America, nobody could travel to Albania. So I learned a lot about the food. I have to say I learned some swear words. Um, but I didn't get to have my cultural history. It was kept from me because of political boundaries. And you have a chance to break that. That's quite meaningful to me. You know, I never knew when I came to a country where I was going to suddenly see rooms full of Albanians and what that would feel like. I said, wow, I, I, can't, you know, I can't believe it, but it's really tremendous. And so I think I can also even say for a lot of Albanians growing up in America, we were robbed of that relationship, but that's another chance. There are people around the world that look to this country with great hope. And so thank you.